So as we explore this notion of our origins today um, and who we are as individuals, we know that much of what we are and who we are was formed at a young age. And so one of the questions that I wanted to explore was an easy one to ask, but not so easy to answer, which is, do you recall the very first thing that you imagined? Not, not many people can, and it took, took me a while to think about it. But it's our imagination that allowed us to ask, what if? What if I knew what my parents knew? What if I had superpowers? Uh, and it's our imagination that got us through difficult times and made us uh, realize a more sophisticated reality as we grew. And we used that imagination when we were younger. We were role playing, playing house, playing tag. And I realized as I was digging into my own memories and trying to remember what that first memory was, for me, it was that of the dragon. And the dragon represented this majestic, mythic creature, right? That it was, it was this intelligent, cunning, and yet it was elegant and it could take flight. And it became this reoccurring motif that I realized later on that would follow me. You see, I grew up on a farm um, in the northwest suburbs. And you don't see it here, but it's in the pasture uh, that used to be there. And, uh, and we had cows and, and we had woods in the back. And I would be sitting in front of the TV and my mom would come in and she would end up saying one of two things. She'd either say, you need to move back or you're gonna go blind. Or she'd say, you need to get outside and get some fresh air. And what she didn't realize was that she was inspiring me to go find my imagination. Because with my buddies, we found some plywood and we created this tree fort outside. And in that tree fort, it became our castle, our lair. Uh, it, it was these endless opportunities for us to explore our imagination. Which at the same time, and here's the dragon reoccurring, but I was, how many people know Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah? I, so I was one of those, those geeks. And, and it was one of those things that, in doing that, was a very social activity, but it engages everyone in their imagination. You see, the dungeon master has to give you a story, and, he, and that story you pick up on as a player. And it's this shared world that you imagine together. And so, as, as we do that, I, it gives you the ability to create and tell your own story. And so I think it's probably one of those things that led me to go become an English lit major and a medieval history minor uh, and Latin as four semesters because my parents were big believers in liberal arts as, and they said, you can always go back and get an MBA or a dental degree, but you'll never go back and study the classics. And so when I was younger, one of the things they did was give me this girder and panel set Simple, harmless toy, but it turned me into like Richard Dreyfus in the Close Encounters of the Third Kind where he had the mashed potatoes and he was just making the Devil's Tower. I, I was making replicas of the Sears Tower over and over, about four feet high because that was all I could reach. But um, it, was, it was this incredible journey on exploring my imagination. And what I realized was that later on, it propelled me to become an architect. And it, it drove me to think about kind of what, what could be built. And then when I got into my tween years, I, I geeked out again. I would sit there at the end of this news program and it had a digital fly-through of the city of Chicago. And back in the 80s, that was the coolest thing to me because it was the digital world coming to life. And I thought about how, what that meant. And ultimately, when I went on to become, I would take CAD courses at a community college while I was in high school. And then ultimately, the firm that I ended up working at not only designed this fly-through, but also designed the Sears Tower. So it's weird how things come around. But at the same time, in exploring that digital and, and the physical intertwining, I absorbed movies like Tron and War Games and couldn't get enough of, of how that exploration happened. And I wanted to be a hacker so much that I, for those of you who are familiar with the, the movie, there's a game in there called Global Thermonuclear War. And I, oops, and I simulated that. Um, there we go. And I simulated that in my computer. And 
I, thank goodness I didn't have a modem because I probably would have caused mischief, but it was this craving for this digital connection to, to the outside. And about that time, where that digital and that social engagement was happening was in the arcades. And it was an interesting period in time because people went there to hang out with each other and, and enjoy the entertainment, but it was, a play, it was a nexus for entertainment. And so one of the things that happened was the console got invented. And it brought gaming in, into our homes. And it was a blessing and a curse. Because now you could play with your friends but it changed the social structure of how we engaged with each other, right? Now you have multiplayer online, but yet you're not really directly engaging with those people. And so as I came home one day and I was hearing my mom in the back of my head because I saw my two tween kids, I have a son and a daughter, both enmeshed on their mobile devices and it was a bright sunny day and I was sitting there saying, you need to get outside and get some fresh air then I realized there had to be a way to bring the digital in and, uh, and enhance what could happen in the physical. And so kind of thinking back and forth how that engagement happens, you look at how we all engage our smartphones, right? And it's no small feat to get somebody off their phone when we're out. And one of the things that has become apparent, a recent study showed that even though we have more opportunities for social engagement, people actually feel more socially isolated because of the constructs of having to follow people, their shared information and so on, but that direct communication isn't happening in a first person, which might be the reason why it's giving rise to live action role playing. Now, some of you may have heard of LARPing. <laughs> well, it's actually become very, very popular on college campuses. It's been around for about uh, 20 years or so. Games like Assassin and Humans vs. Zombies, you're using Nerf guns and water pistols and so on. But you can get up to 400 people playing in one of these games and it can last for days on end. And so kind of thinking about the constructs of that <laughs> physical gaming and how that might intertwine with the digital was what we sought to explore in developing the LightShot platform. And so we live in a great era right now, particularly as entrepreneurs, that you have access to accessible coding. You, you can leverage the cloud. And we have a proliferation of inexpensive sensors that are easy to create, and, which is good for me because I was able to go down and start tinkering. And so utilizing those sensors and utilizing geolocation able to come up with the ability to know what spell you're casting using accelerometers and being able to tell where your teammates are using GPS and sharing that information via the cloud. And so we thought about the fact that we didn't want people stuck on their, staring at their phones because that would cramp the, the gaming experience. And so we began to, to think about that next wave of technology, which, as known as augmented reality, that they it's been projected that that will be equivalent to the same as the mobile revolution. So a bit of a primer on augmented reality and virtual reality. Virtual reality is a very immersive world. Uh, it's a 3D model world with a, a headset that allows you to see 360. The augmented reality glasses allow you to see through, and it's a digital overlay of your current physical environment. And so we, we are at the beginning of augmented reality. Some of you may recognize some of these images of Pokemon Go and Ingress, which is a, a Google game. Both have AR components to it and both geolocation games. But what we began to really think about was how does that build on itself and how do we bring in true augmented reality to actual gaming? And so as we did that, we thought about how do the storylines evolve if, you, if you're able to think about consuming that information right there in front of your eyes where, where most of our information wants to be consumed from the ocular and the audio level. So you take, as an architect, this is a, I think we'd all agree, pretty bland space. But now you take the digital and you do an overlay 
And now you can start to envision a world that begins to change. And now you start to write the storylines that can change how we tell our own stories or how we gauge with each other. So that bland hallway in your house becomes something of a cargo bay in a spaceship, or it becomes a pathway in a jungle that you're trying to find treasure in, at old temples. And so we began to think about that information. And, and what we found when we were doing our early iterations was contrary to Iron Man, where he has all of these different levels of information in his heads-up display or HUD, uh, we found that people got overwhelmed when we put too much information in. And so we had to go through various iterations to, to find that right mix. And so this is a video of one of our games called Assassin. And what you're gonna see in the HUD is it identifies whether you're the target or the assassin, and there's a timer up in the right-hand corner. And all of this information is being generated through the sensors and the hardware and being leveraged the computing power of your smartphone. But it becomes seamless. The magnetometer at the bottom is a compass showing you where your opponent is. The shields get, can get activated. But now all of this information is right there at the ocular level. So as you're playing, you, you can, it can be a, a shooting game, it can be a, a game where you're playing a medieval uh, warrior, a wizard, ranger. The, the opportunities are, are quite endless. And so all of this information is going through the cloud. And so we take that and we build upon that level of information that, that's happening. And you begin to think about the storylines that can really take place. Um, Janet Murray, who wrote a book back in the 90s called Hamlet on the Holodeck, foretold of the digital and the physical gaming coming together. And, and she had a great quote that said, perhaps the next great Shakespeare of this world will be a live action GM who is actually a computer scientist. And so take that and layer in haptic feedback. So now we, you may be aware that suits exist, that you have speakers, and it provides a sonic uh, charge if it, you're in a game and you're simulating a concussion charge. Or maybe that suit gets cold because you've been blasted by a freeze ray. Now think of digital X games, where the arena is changed and the people are playing with each other, and now the spectator can be a part of the game through the digital process as well. And so that type of, of gaming and the physical begin to intertwine. And I'll take it one step further. Introduce machine learning. So now you're interfacing with AI characters, artificial intelligence, that are learning what your response is. So unlike the choose of your own adventure books, where you had to turn to another page, here, the, the game is learning about you, so the ending is never the same. And now you have the opportunity to create an infinite amount of storylines as you're engaging these characters. And so I come back to the motif of the dragon because for me it represents that harnessing that creativity. As an architect here in the US, we would have many foreign firms come and approach us to design buildings around the world. And what we found was that was happening because people, we have an outlet for creativity that doesn't exist in many places around the world. And we need to learn to nurture that creativity because that will be one of our greatest exports in the 21st century. The ability to create and to imagine and that ability for us to think outside of the box is going to be the difference as, as we move into this next generation of design and technology. And so I'll leave you with, everyone needs to find their story. They need to live it, they need to write it. And then don't let anyone persuade you from finding your inner kid, because you may just found the next great idea. Thanks.